Hi, and welcome to another episode of Africa Talks Tech. In today's episode, we're exploring Africa's cashless ecosystem by talking to two, three great gentlemen, I do beg your pardon, from a company called Dream Overall that have been around for quite a while. They share their insights into um, fintech and all kinds of like advice as well as predicting a little bit. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that, Kazim. Um, what do you think? Yes, very much so. Um, Africa now, he's got so many ways of moving money around. And uh, so we have digital platforms now that powers that. Uh, so from the guys, we're going to be learning how all of those things is being put together and uh, what we can expect as the future of cashless in Africa. So without much of ado, let's catch up with Henry, Charles and Claude. Welcome to Africa Talks Tech uh, this afternoon. Uh, so today on the show, we're going to be exploring Africa, a cashless ecosystem. And, uh, you know, before now, uh, people usually pay for services in Africa, uh, you know, by moving a lot of money around. Uh, but it has really changed now, you know, so we now have things being digitalized. So we have a lot of cashless, uh, you know, platform systems in place now all over Africa. And today we've got three gentlemen on the show with us today to walk us through today's topic. Uh, but first, my name is Kazim Adebuega. I'm an IT professional and I lead a team of very good and talented people at the Lasso CBT. And I also got my very good friend and partner on the show with me, Sam. It's over to you now. Oh, hi. Um, thank you. I'm Sam Erskine, I'm based out in the UK, and I'm head of cloud engagements for a large organization. Um, but for the purpose of this show, uh, I'm very, very proud and happy to welcome um, three esteemed gentlemen from Ghana um, that have been leading the way in a very interesting space for us. So without much of ado, um, welcome to the Dream Oval team. And I'll leave it to, um, should we start with you, Henry, to introduce Introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about um, Dream Mobile. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Henry Sampson. Dream Mobile started sometime around 2007, um, right after Ashesi. We had just finished Ashesi um, and we, we were doing different stuff, we, basically, about four guys um, and three ladies were a lot of people doing different stuff. We had tasted a bit of entrepreneurship because of there was a, a bit of entrepreneurial fever, if I should put it, because when we were in second year in Ashesi, we had opportunity of solving a really big problem around traffic lights. Um, we had a junction somewhere in Teshi, which was was notorious to um, traffic jams. Basically, there was no traffic light there, and what was very apparent was that you couldn't just put a, a normal signaling traffic light in there. What you needed to do was you needed to um, have some kind of sensory in the ground, and that was exciting for us, um, having gone to Ghanaian um, secondary schools, mostly schooled, everybody schooled in Ghana, solving problems that was very relevant to our commute. Um, was really exciting. We got recognized by government. We got put into an incubator um, to accelerate sort of creating the, the traffic light and all. Now, so that just got all of us thinking about um, creating businesses that truly change stuff, right? And then that led into after school, we we wanted to venture out. Um, doing a PayPal in Africa was like really exciting, but there were so many ideas we wanted to start out with, right? But we said, I mean, first thing we should kill is basically create the the, um, the sort of financial digitization platform that sort of boosts commerce across the continent. And the way we thought about it from the beginning was that it's across the continent and not necessarily just um, in Ghana, right? Even though we're starting in Ghana in the, in, in, in the Ashesi lab, <laughs> Ashesi hardware lab, um, where we, we had our first office before we moved out when the students were coming back for the semester. So that that's sort of um, the humble beginnings we we, we, we had. And the, the main reason we, we, we stuck together was because of the initial stuff I spoke about in terms of the traffic light project, the incubator project. 
Um, and it eventually became four guys. You see three guys here today. Um, there's also Derry. Derry was a part of us. Um, and uh, we, 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 we sort of went out to basically build this financial ecosystem around not necessarily using cash. And we saw cash as our biggest com competitor, um, essentially strategizing. And we've been building that for the past 14 years. Um, we've ventured in different directions, but at the core of it is um, trying to make sure that commerce across the continent itself is well connected through our systems. And that, that we are quite passionate about till date. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. I believe you've covered the company and how you got there. So it doesn't leave much room for Claude and um, Charles. I'm sure you'll catch up later, but if you can at least just let us know your titles and something unique about the two of you and see what you can do with regards to making sure that Henry doesn't get all the spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'll, I'll go. Um, so also co-founder and um, CEO uh, at Dream of All, um, and um, we, to, to Henry's point, right, we always believed that um, Africa didn't need to lag behind when it came to, to digital payments and digitization in, in general. Um, we started at a time where, you know, that, that was just before even MTN Ghana launched in, in Ghana, and um, that was just before or just around the same time that the iPhone was launched, right? So. We, we, we really, we, we had a, a good vision, I believe, right? And over the period, the um, ecosystem has, has been um, metamorphosing, it's been changing. And, and um, when we started out, it wasn't entirely complete. So we would need to build one side of the ecosystem, then we we'll build another side of the ecosystem. And then over the period, we had a number of products that came together to, to enable us offer our customers like a, a digital payments experience. Um, we right now have more or less sort of settled in and we have a, a platform that we are pushing and for we, we believe that we are, you know, enabling a payments infrastructure, a payments digitization infrastructure, right, with core of our customers being large institutions and banks and fintechs, right. So we can easily, you know, bootstrap a, a, a company that's looking to digitize, a bank that's looking to digitize. We have technology to enable you, you know, catch up with competition, to enable you ensure that your customers can transact in, 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 in the ways that that will help them um, boost their businesses, right? So um, just, just in a nutshell, we, we currently uh, are in, um, we are, we are incorporated in Cote d'Ivoire. We are expanding the business aggressively. We have our solutions being used in Zimbabwe. We process millions and millions of dollars a day in, in, in a dream of all, and we continue to expand and our vision is to become the largest process of financial transactions in Africa. So I'll, I'll pass it on to Charles. <laughs> so we, <laughs> Charles. Well, there, there you have it. When the CEO speaks, there's very little left for you to say. Um, so, Hans, Charles Hansen Kau is, is the full name. Um, on a personal level, um, I'm an avid cyclist, and so I really do enjoy spending my free time outside of the family, um, you know, cycling between cities and more recently between countries. Um, I enjoy that thoroughly. Um, however, when I have my business hat on, um, at Dream of All, I lead the enterprise and consulting teams. Um, and our job is to just ensure that all our products and our projects are executed um, in a very innovative and timely fashion. I think in terms of, you know, the, the background of Dream of All, um, Henry and Claude have spoken at length about it. The other thing I think I would speak to, which will probably taper into further conversations, is Henry mentioned that we started off thinking about payments, right? And as you all know, payments, um, in order to, to really profit from payments, you need the volumes. Um, and to have the volumes, you know, you need to, to, you need to be strategic and, and, and aggressively grow that. Claude mentioned that at the time we started, and indeed it was actually the year that um, iPhone was launched in 2007. Um, payments industry was not what it is today, right? Um, there was a lot of um, hesitation towards it. And so between when we started the business till about, you know, fast forward seven years, five years into the business, 
um, payment wasn't as big as it is today. Um, however, we still had, you know, bills to pay, we still had salaries to pay and all that. Um, fortunately, one of the things that we found useful while we were in school was that we were very entrepreneurial, even with technology. Um, and so we leveraged that to bring us what we refer to as bread and butter um, business, right? So we build applications, mobile apps. We did some work with um, the Grameen Foundation and Hershey's um, yeah. chocolate. And then, of course, we uh, build websites and so on and so forth. And as we, as we built those to sustain ourselves, we also kept the traction on the payments bit um, because the vision was for Africa and it was big. Um, but I just wanted to give a bit of context into into how we were in the wilderness um, up until more recently. All right, uh, thank thank you very much for uh, that. And so so you pretty much uh, you know told us about uh, some of the things uh, you're doing, how uh, the company started, and all of that. Uh, but there seem to be a lot of innovations happening, you know, in the fintech space. Uh, all around Africa today. Uh, so, so it would be nice to hear from you. Uh, can you tell us more about what is happening in the cashless and fintech space in Africa? And uh, perhaps uh, you could find a place to squeeze in uh, what you guys are doing, you know, specifically now, uh, you know, around that space. So uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll 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 just start and then we'll do a round robin. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. in, ter in terms of what's been happening, I mean, from the data that we see and and what we sit on here at Dreamover, we we do see that um, the current crisis, right, has changed and uh, behavior um, around um, um, cashless transactions, right. And during the various lockdowns that we had, we saw an uptake of, of our solutions and, and, um, and systems that we had put in place for our various customers, banks and large merchants, right? Where now you still needed to make payments even though there was a lockdown. So it's like, hey, that thing that these guys were advertising the other day, let me go try it out. Wow, it works. Then you try it out one, two, three times and then it just doesn't make sense to take the trotro, go and cash out from the ATM, you know, cross the big gutter and go and pay. It just didn't make sense anymore. So in terms of what's happening in the space, I feel like there's there's serious growth happening because there's now an appreciation for, for the convenience and the the, um, the overall value that this this drives. It's a bit difficult to... to pe people don't obviously see that that Trotro took like maybe five CDs to the junction and then five CDs back and, you know, but once you, you get them to experience it, there's no going back. And there is definitely growth. We see lots and lots of innovations, partnerships, you know, now you can um, you can pay for 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 like uh, your church. I saw one one fintech um, you know, you pay your church tithes and they give you like life insurance or they give you some some form of insurance, right? So a whole bunch of different things are going on on, on that on, at that level and, and, and pretty much um, we see a lot of catalysis from, from um, the, the crisis that we are, we are going through. And, and we, we are happy to, to, to have been able to support our customers, right? To, to help them continue their businesses, to help them, you know, continue the, the, the making money and, 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 you know, help, helping their livelihood. So I, I, I think I'll just pass it on to um, Charles or Henry to, to, to add or, yeah. Sure, thanks, um, Claude. So just, just a bit of, of, of context. I think one of the things that's been very evident and maybe speaks to why we see such um, a strong drive and growth in the fintech space has been because of the um, revolutions, let me put it that way, that's happened in prior times, right? So starting off with the mobile penetration um, and then followed by then um, internet penetration has laid a really great foundation. Um, and I think those foundations were triggered right, by the lack of other infrastructure. So for example, if I needed to send money to my mom who was back in the village, spending eight hours in a, in a bus is inconvenient versus sending the money instantly. Um, and so those inconveniences and those pain points um, by virtue of, of, of our continent um, spurred the interest and the convenience. And I think what's happened to Claude's point in the last, um, well, in the last two years especially is that exponential drive to a new lifestyle, right? Because prior to the pandemic, 
uh, payments were still happening. We've heard successful stories of M-Pesa in Kenya and mobile money in West Africa and so on and so forth. So it was always there, but I think um, more than ever, the, the base has increased significantly. Um, and as people try to be a bit more cautious um, of, of, of interacting um, physically, this has now become a lifestyle. Even so much so when the lockdown was lifted, you still saw that you know the, the, the interest in payment um, utilization was fairly sustained, right? And I think that's that's a great testament to um, how things have have evolved. Um, and maybe also in a in a in an interesting way, um, one of the components that triggered all of this and fueled it was actually the banks, right? And so you notice the spike in growth of of digital payments today is not so much powered by the banks as it is powered by the um, other non-financial institutions like the telcos, right? Banks for a long time were very intimidating, had a lot of roadblocks in accessing um, even bank accounts or capital and so on and so forth. So for the large critical mass, um, it wasn't always a favorable institution. And so when these alternatives came and so solved their pain points on their turf, um, that then, you know, created the adoption. But of course, the pandemic has really um, skyrocketed and, and grown a little exponentially um, for the kind of adoption and, and frequency in payments. Um, in, in terms of updates on the continents, a lot. I don't think we can cover it on, on a single show. <laughs> Uh, just to, to sort of give context to Claude's point about how the pandemic itself has been beneficial to getting payments or cashless um, mindsets disseminated much faster than anybody could have advertised for, right? We had we have a, a, a merchant who um, whose annual uh, whose annual turnover is about one twenty million dollars, right? And um, most of that have moved digital. So they used to have on-prem um, um, gates for getting, taking the money. Most of that cash is moving to digital. When I say most, over tenfold, right, um, increase um, before the pandemic. So definitely nobody could have asked for a better way of disseminating the fact that when it does come down to um, isolation and other, other other things that that makes digital meaningful i mean the, the, we, we couldn't have communicated in any ad right you could have you could have as, you could have said so many things in an ad about how if you were if you were in some corners in the middle of the night there's so many ads that we've done around those kind of scenarios right but what i think the the virus did was that it sort of became very clear that when you are restricted and when you're in a hard constraint like this, you would need digital services, right, to, to enable. And therefore, what that did, and, and, and segueing to what Charles was talking about, the internet penetration and all, right, one of the one of the key revolutions Africa has not missed out on is the mobile revolution. I, we are very strong believers in, in, in that in, in, in Dream of All. And if we haven't missed out on the mobile, mobile revolution, it was a strong basis to deploy very extensive digital solutions. And, and finance is just one of them. And, 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 and its its use on the continent is so great. I mean, for for the SDGs, we, we, we and, and most of the SDGs are enabled by digital finance, right? And from from two, three and and, and all. So it's important to it's it's, it's, it's important that whatever we've gained in this period does not sort of die out because we we were the least hit by the virus, which which is also another great thing. Um, even though we're least hit, we still got the benefit of, of DFI like really, really um, enormously on the continent. Um, what we also see is a lot of Bitcoin discussions on the continent. And the Bitcoin discussions um, initially was more around um, I mean, it's moved more towards asset now, but it was more around transferring money across border, right? Which is where AFTA comes in. Like as AFTA gets implemented, we we are seeing that within phase one, um, the cross-border payment is a key part of AFTA, and we are we are excited about that. We know that it is is definitely going to create um, bigger commerce across the continent, which is in fact what our vision is, and so we are. We are extremely excited about its its possibilities. Bitcoin, though, has been frowned on by a number of regulators, and that sort of takes me into how regulation is playing out in the entire 
in the entire space. The, in some spaces, there's less regulation and therefore players are moving fast. I mean, places like Nigeria and Ghana, though, we have very alert regulators. <laughs> we have regulators who are not sleeping, right? I would commend the Ghanaian regulators. Recently, they launched a, a sandbox um, to help those who are trying to innovate, those who are trying to create new products, be able to test them out much quicker to the general, uh, to sort of the general public um, without requiring the very expensive licenses that they have put in place um, before you can you can sort of go general. So. I think that it's, it's a diverse set of things happening. I think the regulator hand is, is sort of very different across the continent. Some are hard-handed, some are proactive, some are um, very, very engaging, uh, all sorts. So the entire spectrum, in terms of the technologies being adopted, is really on need um, basis. And therefore, you see, um, I mean, as much as the, the, the car schemes are trying to push, it's very, very clear on the continent that the indigenous mobile uh, money solutions are the winners, right? And they've captured a good amount of the market because of their focus on financial inclusion, right? And, and making that available to the remotest parts of the continent. So that's sort of um, a little I can say I can, <laughs> about what's happening, I'll update, yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, that's fantastic. And, you know, um, as Henry said, we could probably do 10 shows on um, your organization and the knowledge pool that you've got. What I want to do is, um, you know, as um, the three of you were answering your questions, you were using words like trotro. Um, for those that are not from the continent, it's our classic bone shaker. It's basically a vehicle that's made out of wood that if you have to ride on it for about an hour, you get a free massage. That's the polite way of putting it, <laughs> right? Um, um, what I also wanted to share that you three haven't really driven and I'm very proud of is that these are three esteemed gentlemen that were educated in Ghana, went to a technical institute in Ghana and have been innovating in this space. And I think for myself personally, I'm very proud and same as Kazim because all too often the lens that's shown is that Africa is behind the curve. Um, I've been to um, Ghana and like, you know, mobile money and all that. It's our limitations have driven innovation. So uh, perhaps, you know, just a, a short couple of words from, you know, the three of you um, pick one because, you know, we want to make sure um, who's got a poshest voice out here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but pick one because I just wanted to say, you know, you mentioned Asishi. Um, what kind of things, right? This isn't a question that you perhaps were anticipating, but how have you seen innovation being driven from the grassroots, in your opinion, um, from an African lens? Um, so let me quickly um, chime in on that. So one of, one of the things which is exciting, most exciting for me is when I, I look at engineering at Ashesi, right? So when we were in Ashesi, there was no engineering option, right? And when I looked at engineering at Ashesi and then began also looking at the kind of advancements that you um, in terms of student organized advancement in KNUST. So as, as Dreamover, we sponsored a number of events in KNUST um, and Ashesi, of course, we sponsored events at Ashesi as well. But uh, we were... You need to uh, um, um, explain KNUST. Yes, KNUST is true. Ashesi University. University. Uh, University. KNUST is like the premier technology university in Ghana, right? It's uh, Kwame Nkrumah is... Um, University of Science and Technology, and it's it's produced some of the brightest um, technologists um, on the continent, right? Um, some that are even not on the continent and innovating elsewhere as well. The one of the things we we realized very quickly were, was the fact that the internet had created a highway of knowledge which most people did not anticipate would have a role on effect in terms of organization for students and innovation in, in, in tertiary institutions. So we, we had a number of hackathons in, in tertiary institutions and 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 collaboration with 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 these students. And what one one thing was so surprising for us, right? The the level of technical understanding within the schools were much, much higher than when we were in school, right? And we year after year we saw that it kept elevating. It kept going, it kept going up. And the, the kind of problems students were willing to solve within the hackathons 
kept getting more challenging. And the more you saw in terms of students who actually complete those kind of challenges in the hackathons, right? And, and these same kind of students you see coming out and trying to be entrepreneurs because they believe they can create. And today we have creator, uh, creator spaces, we have creator groups, right? Um, maker groups, right? Um, they, are, they are typically called, called around. There were so people doing electronics, people doing computing, people coming together to do all sorts of really, really innovative stuff. And so even though sometimes the infrastructure may not fully be there with many, many institutions, one of the things we've realized very, very, um, we, we are very, very excited about on the continent is the availability of information, right? And as internet penetration goes up and up and up and up, there's a lot more um, innovation we are seeing coming from the tertiary institutions. Now, not just the tertiary institutions, now we are seeing the thriving of robotics within the secondary institutions. And I think that is super exciting because my first introduction to robotics was in university. And I was super excited about it because I did, I, it just all made sense to me. I, I, if we could get computers to think, I mean, we'll solve a lot of things, right? But I, I, I was so excited about it. And to think that now it's gone into secondary schools. And for some um, junior high schools, they are actually doing robotics and coding as well. And I think that that level of involvement is, is elevating the innovation. Recently, Dreamover has been working with the, um, the, the Ghana Education Service to incorporate coding as well into curriculums, right? And that's exciting. If, if at a very basic level, we are getting people to think at these conceptual levels, I think that we can only be hopeful about what the next generation will be innovating. And even in this current state, when you're hiring, you realize that the caliber is going up. Right, so that that's sort of my. I hope that was even little at all, if not uh, an entire. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I guess Kazim, you do have a couple more questions, right? And yes. uh, Henry's covered a great depth so far. So I I don't know what else we can ask them. <laughs> okay, just just this morning, uh, you know, I was trying to read the dailies when I got into the office this morning. And I saw the introduction of, uh, you know, this QR code into the payment service space, you know, by a tech company uh, in Ghana, right? So, so this seemed like a very big leap forward, you know, to me, because um, I see this is really going to reduce the pressure on the use of, you know, the very popular POS system. So, so I want to ask, uh, what infrastructure exactly are we leveraging in Africa, you know, that is contributing to this so much growth, uh, you know, in the fintech space? Do you want to walk us through a few of those? Yeah, um, yeah, so it, I'll, I'll just touch a, a little bit on that. So, um, yeah, the QR code, um, 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 like so, so Ghana released a QR code specification, right? Um, by our our local switch, right? Um, and it's 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 really interesting for 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 us. Um, it's it's opens up a number of opportunities for us. And um, one thing I like to mention too is that Dreamoval did have a QR code solution out there in our in our Slipey platform that we we collaborate with the uh, Stambic Bank. Ghana in back in 2015. So I, I, I dare say we were one of the first people to um, roll out wow. the QR code solution, right? However, you know, as a company, we 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 are for the advancement of 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 the entire ecosystem. So having a, a, a countrywide um, QR code um, specification that we can all implement and integrate into would help us move the development and growth increase it, make it faster, right? So it's, it's really great. And I mean, essentially what they're saying is that if you implement that and you have your own application, we could, we could, I could pay your merchants, you could pay our merchants, and then the settlement will happen in the back end. You know, at the end of the day, we all get to increase the market and, and, and we, we all can benefit from that. And so there is generally a drive towards putting in place infrastructure. Like I mentioned in the ecosystem, there have been so many gaps. When we started out with like our consumer facing application, we immediately realized that we needed to build a, 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 a merchant aggregation and, and switching platform, which 
to 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 solve a gap in the in the system. And now we sell that infrastructure to banks and other other systems. I mean, for us, we we just want to, of course, once you are what you call a license and you 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 follow the rules of anti money laundering, counter terrorism, you know, um, screening and all of these things, right? We believe that it should be democratized, right? As long as you can meet the um, the, the requirements, you we, we should allow the infrastructure to be to be uh, democratized so that other companies, because because we mean we don't necessarily, for example, play in the crowdfunding space, right? So yeah. you also don't want to say, okay, only one government institution should be responsible for bringing infrastructure. It's going to hinder growth and innovation, right? So we, somehow we need to just have open APIs. We have to have specifications such that we can all integrate and interact with with with, with all these services. And at some point, it will it will settle down, right? It will settle down, and 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 then we will we'll see that uh, as a continent, as as a people, we would have developed and and we'll have a very unique um, and infrastructure that the rest of the world will would be would be have um, writing use cases on business use cases on for academic use cases, <laughs> case studies. Yeah, sorry, case studies, academic case studies. Or, yeah, so just my contribution to that one. Yeah, Charles. Excellent, and you know. Um, I've got one specifically for Charles because we come in towards the end of the time we allowed for this specific show. And this is a part two, part three, part four um, that I envisage. Um, what I want to um, pivot on a little bit, Charles, is to say that looking at the next generation coming in and putting yourself in the shoes, if you were to reverse your age, what would be the sort of advice you will give that young Charles um, that, you know, effectively you're a hologram then. So what would you say to this next generation, given that they are going to be inheriting, Africa has got bad governance, Africa is not innovative, um, Africa is, um, you know, behind the world. Speaking to you, I don't think I've got that lens, but what would you tell that young you um, to avoid being tattooed with that hurdle? Um, I think, you know, this is something that I, I tend to speak around a bit, um, especially to my daughter and some of those that I mentor. Um, the stereotypes will always be there, right? They'll always be there because they were formed before you got there. However, you have the power to break through stereotypes. And I think there are a number of um, sequential or maybe in parallel um, ways to go about that. I think, first of all, you need to understand that you can't be your best self by yourself, right? You need to um, partner. You need to um, learn from others. You need to collaborate. It's it's there's there's a reason why they they, they say that there's strength in unity, right? Um, so understand that there are a lot of, there are a lot of people who are thinking alike like you, who are wanting Africa to be um, seen in, through a better lens like you, and so always seek out for collaborations as opposed to competing, right? Um, competition is great, but collaboration takes you even further, right? Um, and when you do get into whatever industry, whether it's fintech or health or any other, carve a niche, right, and, and stand out. I mean, nobody was born to blend in, but carve a niche and stand out, right? The ideas the ideas are enormous. They're, they're endless, um, and they don't belong to any one person, right? Um, and once you find that idea, let's, 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 let's the, um, the driver for executing that idea not necessarily be the solution, right, but the problem. Um, it's always important to focus on the problem and not the solution, because the more you focus on the problem, the better you get at providing the solution, right? Um, if you think about the solution, then you're essentially trying to take an idea that you have and shove it down people's throat. But when you think about the problem, you're looking at it from their perspective, which is very, very important, focusing on the customer, understanding your market, all those things blend into um, getting you to focus very specifically on the problem. And out of that, of course, you then spun out all of the different solutions. And, you know, we found out that you spun out solutions that you didn't even think about in the, in the, in the, um, when you started off, right? So those are the things I would say. One, collaborate, find ways to partner um, and, and grow in unity with, with others. Um, and then let, of course, your desire to fix a pain point or a problem that you face um, and not the solution. Thank you very much for that. So I, I do have one more question, one last question from me before perhaps we close out now. Um, 
we know now that uh, you know in Africa today there are a lot of ways to move money around, right? So, so I want to know, being uh, people who have been in the business for some time, so so it would be nice to hear from you. What is the next big thing that we can expect, uh, you know, as the future of cashless in Africa? So maybe if uh, Andrew will want to, you know, go for this one. Um, th thank you very much. So. <laughs> One of the one of the things I think Africa has solved really well for is um, has so really has solved really really well is transfer, right? So transferring money in most of the mobile money successful countries is a huge success, right? Yeah. The the next frontier is very very clear to everybody. It's payments, right? Um, and the reason being that number one, cash is can never go offline if you know what I mean. Um, it, it does not have buffering. It does not have like cash. You deliver it to me. I see the cash. It is cash. I take it. I deliver the service, right? It is instant and it has a certain feel of I have received value and the value is trusted and it will be there that we are now trying to attain within payments. You see, when we are doing transfer, the window of success is larger. But for payments, the window of success is much shorter because people, because of the way in which cash has been used for payments and for getting things instantly done, most people expect the, the, the payment experience to be very, very different from the transfer experience. So transfer, you may do it, it doesn't go through, you try it because you know that it, it doesn't matter how much you try, it's still better than picking a car from where you are to deliver the money elsewhere. So the transfer will always be something where digital finance wins, right? But on the other hand, when we talk about payments, most people expect instant um, satisfaction. And I think that the infrastructure in Africa is now growing. Um, we have we have a greater, um, in terms of internet penetration is going up higher and higher right but then we are not still at the level where we can say that our payment infrastructure is kind of perfect right so in terms of next frontier i'm seeing we we have um, ussd ussd is cumbersome doesn't matter how much you convince me about um it's working offline and all it's cumbersome we need to we need greater infrastructure around um, giving access um, for payments to be done and all. And number two, exactly what Gibbs is doing with GHQR, in payments, monopoly would be very, very bad. There cannot be monopolies in payments. There can be big players, but there can't be monopolies. There must be enough competition to make sure that the customers win at the end. And therefore, having open APIs across, for cross-border payments and then for um, the, like what you, you, you talked about, Kazim, in Ghana, where they have done GHQR, which gives, democratizes, gives everybody the opportunity to play within the payment space and then leaves the innovation to the players is, is really vital because that's how we push that pen to make payments really, really ubiquitous when it comes to digital finance. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Wish we had much more time to continue chatting, but what we will do is when we do share the content of this video, we'll um, share links to your sites, any white papers that come in play, and definitely commit you to coming back to discuss some more. And I would like to see, you know, the next innovation come through. But um, for myself, thank you very much for temporarily putting me back in Ghana, um, but I'm always <laughs> going to be permanently there and um, letting Kazim know that we make the best jollof as well. I said it on camera. I said, hey. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you so much. So I think, uh, you know, this is how much time is going to permit us today. So that's our show for today, people. Uh, so be sure to follow us on YouTube uh, so you can get notifications. So anytime we have, uh, you know, any new content up on YouTube, and you can as well rewatch our previous episode on YouTube as well. So the channel uh, is uh, Africa Talks Tech, and uh, so here's where we're going to draw the curtain. So from myself, uh, Sam, and the rest of the guys. Uh, so it's bye bye from us. So or is there any last word from anyone? You know, to just close out real quickly. 
Yeah, I, I think um, Africa is the future, and 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 we will have um, people from all over the world coming to do fintech tourism. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank uh, you very much. For us, yeah, for Africa, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you.